I, I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, Jacob Kalikman. Among other things, he is posting an amazing number of pictures on Mushroom Observer. And as somebody on the board of Mushroom Observer, I was taking a look at uh, some of the stuff that he has posted. He has maybe 15,000 postings of uh, pictures on Mushroom Observer. And um, I, I think um, this is probably driven by his attempt to really be able to identify in the field a lot of um, uh, mushrooms, um, particularly those that are, are, are guild mushrooms. He is um, currently um, at the Matheny Lab in the University of Tennessee, and he has a special focus on fiber caps, uh, which I don't know much about because I don't eat those but he might be able to tell you about those. Um, he's interested in the evolutionary relationship among mushrooms. He tracks genus level taxonomy of guild and other relatives in a compendium on the website uh, on the internet called www.agaric.us. My presentation is gonna be about mushroom forms or macro macro morphology, which is a fun made up word for the exact same thing for mushroom forms. And what I mean by that is just the most basic, simple, obvious features of a mushroom. Does it have a cap? Does it have a stem? Does it have gills or pores? And that is something that pretty much all of you are pretty familiar with, but I think that's okay. Um, I think we can have a lot of um, intuitive, visual familiarity with something and not have a really um, conscious, rigorous kind of familiarity with it. So, um, so that's what I'm gonna aim for here. I'm gonna uh, try to get a little more familiar with them with photos. It's gonna be really simple, easy stuff, maybe even simplistic. Um, there's no cutting edge research or anything here, but it's fascinating stuff for me. And um, I hope uh, you all can get something out of it too. So, I'll start. Um, just to hammer home what I mean by mushroom forms, um, we can consider all of the features of a mushroom at first. Um, crazy stuff like the ecology, the behavior, DNA, whether it's psychedelic or not. And an important cluster of features is the morphology. So the structure of the mushroom, kind of hard to define exactly, especially with the way it's used by real people. But um, you could summarize it maybe as what, what it looks like. Um, so there's micromorphology for microscopic features. And of course, there's macromorphology for macroscopic features, the ones you can see with the naked eye. There are a lot of features still within macromorphology, a lot of subtle features. So you can look at the exact cap texture, the exact consistency of latex, um, exact dimensions. But the most macro features, the biggest ones, are going to be the form. Um, and I, I think it's fun to call it macro macro morphology because it's the biggest ones. So again, does it have a cap? Does it have a stem? Does it have pores or gills? A lot of words and phrases have been used for it. Um, shape is great. Gross morphology is okay. Um, gross macro morphological category is a phrase I actually used in a real paper that got published and it's really ugly, um, but it's shorter than basidium type and I mean a four configuration, which I will never say again. So uh, I also want to contrast what I'm talking about um, with field guide classifications. So at the beginning of any field guide, um, including great online ones like MycoWeb, which this is a screenshot on the left from, you're going to get a, a set of basic mushroom uh, categories. And they're going to be distinguished by a couple features, not just the mushroom form, but also a couple um, maybe slightly more subtle features like uh, jellies are gelatinous, polypores are tough, chanterelles grow on the ground. Um, the highlighting up here is mine, by the way. And that's good. There's a great reason for that. Um, having multiple features right off the bat helps us kind of organize the mushrooms a tiny bit more towards natural categories, but um, it's going to be distracting for my purposes here um, because I want to be really thorough about the forms. I want to um, 
understand what all of them are in some detail. I want to get into their relationships, um, what defines them. So I'm going to try to ignore uh, extraneous features like how squishy the mushroom is. And to do that, I have this classification of mushrooms here. So again, not replacing field guide forms, not supposed to uh, do anything of that sort. Um, the point is just to understand this one set of features a little bit better. So, uh, so I'm gonna try to organize uh, the mushrooms in this and talk a bit about their relationships. I'm going to do it by going over this chart twice. I'm going to go over each symbol, each symbol once really fast right now. Then I'm going to go over all of the categories, all of the forms really slowly. And that's going to take up the whole rest of the presentation. And then you can tell me whether you think that that um, artificial taxonomy makes sense for mushroom forms or not. And also interrupt at any time. Um, I guess I have to hear a person talk because I'm sharing my screen, but um, that would be totally fine too. So um, start with a super simple form, basically a one-dimensional object, a stick or a noodle, or I like to think of it as just a stem, clubs and corals, just extended in one dimension, not really extended in the other two. If your object is extended about the same in all three dimensions, you have a blob maybe a puffball or an earth ball or a truffle. If you have a blob on top of a stick, you have a lollipop, of course. So maybe a stalk puffball or a jelly baby. If you have some kind of blob on top of maybe a cup or a bowl, some kind of a platter, maybe an earth star, maybe a bird's nest, because those have you know eggs inside the nest. And if you have two-dimensional things, two-dimensional plates or bowls or flaps, that are all clustered into one blob-shaped object, you have a sporassoid mushroom. And the most famous ones are the cauliflower mushrooms. But there's also other, other things like leafy jellies. Those are all the sort of isolated categories. And then I'm gonna move into this main chart where we're gonna have rows that have the bases, so really simple mushroom shapes. Then the columns are gonna be elaborations on that. So gills, pores, teeth, and so on. So the first row, um, your base can be just a flat surface against another flat surface, a crust. Um, we call those resupinate, meaning it's lying on its back with its front facing out. You could also have just a cap sticking out. It'll be pileate, meaning it has a cap. It'll be sessile, meaning it doesn't have a stem. And I like to call everything that meets that um, those criteria a bracket. You could call them shelves. Some of them get called conks. Um, the most famous ones have pores, but obviously not all of them. And then, of course, you can have a cap on top of a stem. It'll be pileate stipitate, meaning it has a cap and it has a stem. And all of the most prototypical mushrooms that probably most people think of first when they hear the word mushroom are going to be in that on that base. So on top of all those three, we could have gills, and it'll be called an agaric. It has gills regardless of what shape it is. It could have pores, and it'll be a bully or a polypore. It could have teeth or spines. It'll be a hydnoid mushroom. It could have wrinkles, and it'll be a maruleoid mushroom. And it could be smooth. Um, and if it's smooth and it has a cap, it has something that's sticking out, it'll be called stereoid. So we got gills, pores, teeth, and a wrinkled surface and a smooth surface. Um, I think those are really good to remember. I don't see those five listed often enough, I think. And uh, you can remember them by remembering that Grimes plays the worst songs. That's how I remember it. So GPTWS. All right, there were uh, two more spots on this main chart that I didn't mention yet. Um, and they are different bases, but they correspond to ones I already mentioned on the left side. So can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. So, so I mentioned just a cap over here. And just like we can have just a cap, we can have just a cup over here. And uh, 
a cup, you can think of it just like a flat concave cap. And then you could ask, okay, so what's the fertile surface elaboration on a cup? Well, it can be wrinkled or smooth. We don't really care to distinguish whether it's wrinkled or smooth for cups. And then you could say, well, what if it has gills or pores or teeth on the cup? In that case, we don't care. We're gonna be so distracted by the gills or the pores or the teeth, we're gonna lump it in with the rest of the things that have gills or pores or teeth that aren't cup shaped. So we're left with just one category for cups. And then just like we had caps on stems, we can have cups on stems. And the exact same thing is going on. We don't care if it's wrinkled or smooth, and we really are gonna exclude it and lump it with the other things if it has gills or pores or teeth. So that gives us 22 nice, simple categories. Um, it would be great if we were totally done organizing the mushrooms now, but of course we're not because there's crazy, exciting things like the Lephora penicillata, which this is. And it's really cool because it's like a hybrid between a crust and a coral. So you can see towards the middle parts, it's kind of acting more like a crust. It's kind of smooth and smeared out along the substrate. Towards the edges, it's acting more like a coral with these feathery branches that are kind of sticking up, kind of laid flat. So it's a weird intermediate. And here's five more ways that same species or species group can look. Um, I think they're all super cool and it's really neat, especially if you've been in the woods a lot and seen how corals stick to themselves and crusts stick to themselves mostly, that there's this weird intermediate. So the way I think about it is uh, those basic forms are like landings on a staircase where mushrooms are especially comfortable forming those things, or at least we're especially comfortable sorting them into those categories. And then mushrooms can step maybe briefly along the steps anywhere in between them. Then you can imagine the same thing happening, say, between a classic bolete and polypore shape. Um, and there are mushrooms that have smaller and smaller stems that are more and more eccentric, and uh, you can have any intermediate you want in between. So seeing those, you might ask, um, you might not, but it'd be cool if you ask, can we put all of the mushrooms on one long giant staircase? And of course the answer is yes. And that's what I'm gonna do with the rest of my presentation is I'm gonna try to go through all of the mushrooms by slowly uh, transforming one mushroom into the next category. So I'm gonna start up here with earth stars, then show some kind of intermediate on the way to the next form, which is blobs, and so on and so forth, alternating between forms and intermediates. And then I'm going to try to claim to you that pretty much all the mushrooms are going to have been covered by this little journey. So another way to visualize what I'm going to try to do, I got a little animation here. We're going to be jumping around this grid a whole lot, and we're going to end up with the wrinkled crusts at the end. It's a crazy path. There's nothing important at all about this path. You don't need to memorize it or anything. Um, we could have chosen really any path. Uh, pretty much any two, any pair of mushroom forms are going to have intermediates. Uh, I just chose a path that has a lot of common transitions and a lot of uncommon transitions to spice it up. So I'm going to start. Here's that first category, which I wish I had a good name for. Um, maybe platters, maybe eggs and cups. Um, so we have bird's nests, of course. They have these peridioles inside a cup, which is a curved flat surface. Earth stars, of course. This thing down here is Corticia minziae, and I don't know much about it, but that's what it's shaped like. And we have Spherobolus stellatus, the shooting star fungus or cannonball fungus. And it's not a coincidence that it kind of looks like the Earth star on top of it. They are somewhat closely related. So we can look at how Earth stars are formed. They start out as truffle-like things, like this blob up here. And the outer surface, that peridium, that rind, splits open. And those splits from that rind end up being the rays. And it, uh, it displays that spore sac that was inside uh, now externally. And so if we pick 
intermediate stages, uh, stages of different development of an Earth star, we can find inter any intermediate form we want between an Earth star and the blob. So that takes us to what I'm calling the blobs, puffballs, earth balls, truffles, basically spherical things. There's all kinds of other mushrooms that do that too, of course. Um, I've got Antiloma, Bordivum, a hypoxaloid thing, a jelly down here. Nice simple category. And I'll mess it up right now by looking at Ascopolyparis. So uh, this thing grows on the sides of branches, like you can see, it grows in South America. And it's a cordyceps kind of thing. It's parasitizing bugs underneath. But that's not important for my slideshow. What is important is that it looks kind of like a blob. So obviously it looks pretty similar to these things, but there's some vertical differentiation going on here. Pretty obvious on this one, not so much on the ones on the right, but this white surface down here is fertile and this brick red surface up here is not. So it's importantly fertile, it's got a different color, got a bit of a different shape and structure. And so in a way that makes it more like a cap sticking out, just a big blob-like swollen cap than just an undifferentiated sphere like we're used to with puffballs and truffles. So in that sense, it's like a really thick steroid thing. And steroids are uh, mushrooms with caps that are smooth on the underside. And the ones we're all used to, like sterium, chondrosterium, xylobolus, um, they're all very thin and flap-like, but there's no reason that your steroid couldn't be really thick, like ascopolyparis. So if your steroid thing, uh, well, again, these steroid things didn't have stems. That was part of uh, what makes this category this category. Sometimes it's not obvious whether it has a stem or not. So these things are called uh, Cyphelosterium pusiolum, I think, and they're lichens, even though they don't look like it. And they have these little nubs at the base that the cap tapers into. And you could say it's a stem, you could say it's not a stem, it's kind of intermediate between having one and not. If your steroid thing does have a stem, for sure, it's a stipitate steroid, meaning it has a cap, smooth underside on top of the stem. There's a nice handful of things that do this um, that are pretty unrelated. So all three of these on this slide are in different orders. When people are scrounging together lists of stipitate steroids, they're often gonna include things that don't really have a totally smooth underside. So they might include things that have some faint wrinkles on the underside, or they might even have some really obvious creases breaking it up. And uh, I'd say that these things are intermediate between steroid or smooth and meruleoid or wrinkled. So um, it sounds like a simple category. It would be great if I had some great examples of this, but I actually think it's really interesting that there aren't really any examples of, uh, or any great examples of meruleoid mushrooms with stems. So it seems like pretty much whenever you have a mushroom that has a wrinkled fertile surface under a cap and you have a stem under that cap as well, the wrinkles arrange themselves into some kind of radial structure, some kind of parallel ribs or ridges that makes them start looking like gills. So even on this one, which I should have the best possible example on this slide, even on this one, these wrinkles, which are nice and totally wrinkly up here, are kind of turning into parallel ridges down here that make you think of gills. So if anyone has a counterexample, I would love to hear it. If anyone knows of a meruleoid mushroom with a stem that really totally doesn't have gills, but I haven't found any. So here's that going on more extremely. These mushrooms are all obviously very wrinkled, but they also have those wrinkles arranging themselves into pretty prominent um, radial ribs that are totally on their way to being gills. And if you fully completed that process, you made your radial ridges sharp and clean and broader, and you minimized those uh, pesky wrinkles going in the other directions, 
you would have just a straightforward classic agaric. And there are tons of these, um, everything in between the chunky one and the slender one. Uh, everyone is familiar with those already. So let's mess with that agaric a bit. Um, if we were to grow, if we were to decorate the gills with little veins, then we'd say, okay, it's still an agaric, it just has little veins between the gills. But if we kept growing those veins um, into maybe cross walls and making, and we made them more and more prominent, then eventually uh, those chambers that those cross walls divided the uh, channels between the gills into would look more prominent than the channels between the gills themselves. And those chambers would be something that we might want to call pores. So mushrooms do uh, build intermediates like that. And uh, they especially do that in two clades. So they like to do that in the bolateles, which is these four. And of course, in the bolateles, they probably started out totally poured. And then over evolutionary history, the radial ribs became more prominent relative to those decreasingly, prom decreasingly prominent cross veins. And then the opposite thing presumably happened in the agaricales in the mycenoid merasmioid clade. So this is a mycenoid thing over here, a merasmioid thing over here, where they started out totally normally gilled, and then they got more and more prominent cross veins until they started to look like they might have pores. If we continue that process uh, more and more, we would eventually get just a directionless network that is all just pores. And we've had stems for a while, so we're looking at stipitate polypores. And um, four of these up here, probably everyone is comfortable saying is a stipitate polypore. Um, bolletes are up here too. Bolletes are just squishy polypores with stems. And morels are up here too. Um, morels have big chunky pores that are covering the cap, and the cap is on top of the stem. And I don't think there's really a great reason not to call it a polypore or at least affiliated um, as far as the form goes with polypores. So that's already maybe edgy enough, but just to go one step further, we can look at this crazy morel. This is Morchella anatolica. And instead of having a network of roughly roundish chambers covering the cap, it has these more or less parallel ridges that don't really have much in the way of crossbars. So they have a couple. Um, there's one here, kind of starting to be one here. But mainly, they're just these radial plates that are all kind of coming out of this one point at the top. So we might have to call these gilled mushrooms. We might have to say this is a stipitate agaric, this morchella is. Um, you don't have to do it. I'm not totally ready to do it. But I'm not really sure how long we can deny that it's kind of agaric-like. So I'm not supposed to be talking about morels here. I'm supposed to be on stipitate polypores. And this is supposed to be just a normal stipitate polypore. This is a coltricia, but it didn't always look like this. So when it was young, it started out as some kind of smooth club or basically just a stem. And then the cap started swelling and expanding and eventually pores were extruded out from that smooth upper underside of it. You can see that happening again here. Started out as some kind of simple club. Then it got these dimples, which were the beginnings of pores as the cap widened. And eventually it made these nice full-fledged polypores. So depending on what stage you catch your coltricia at, you can find any intermediate you want between a stipitate polypore and a club. Of course, it's never going to be classified as a club. We're going to say that these immature stages are just disposable immature stages on the way to the real thing. Um, and as one more aside on this slide, we don't just dispose of extra immature stages, we also dispose of extra over mature stages. So we have a pair of cups here. These cups um, have fertile spores in them. They're very often produced by the species that makes them, but it's never going to get classified as a cup because before it was a cup, it was a puffball. So this is a calvaceous species, and um, everyone's going to want to call it a blob and not a cup because it's supposed to be a blob.
So just to check in about where I am, um, we're about a third of the way through the mushrooms, halfway through the slides, so don't get too worried. Um, and I'll jump back in with the clubs and corals. So remember the last thing that happened was we turned a stipitate polypore, the Coltricia, um, into a club by doing a Benjamin Button thing on it. So, so we've got the one-dimensional things there. They can stick up, they can stick down, they can be gelatinous, they can be branched. We usually don't use the names clubs or corals for ascomycetes, but we totally could. Um, so yeah, it's a nice straightforward category. Let's take a really nice simple club, which is the clavulinopsis over here on the left. And if we expanded the top of it just a little bit, we wouldn't care. We would say it's just a club with a slightly widened top. But eventually, if we kept swelling that top more and more, we would get to a lollipop. We would get to something that has a really distinct roundish spherical cap. And mushrooms really don't have any respect whatsoever for any kind of dividing line between those. They will, they're totally comfortable making any and all stages in between uh, not having a cap and having a cap. And I think it's hopeless to try to uh, add any kind of natural dividing line between those. If you totally have a distinct cap, again, I'm calling these lollipops. So you might have a jelly baby like Leosha, it's an ascomycete up here. You might have a fleogena, which is a basidiomycete fungus, even though it looks like a slime mold. You might have pedaxis, which is descended from agarics, and you might have calistoma, which is descended from bullets. And there's lots of other stuff that does this too. Um, it's a very popular form. It's kind of a cool one. So one way to make that blob on top of the stem is to make it out of a puffy crumpled sheet, which is what's going on with the Helvella over here, Helvella vespertina. But the sheet on top of the Helvella stem doesn't have to be that puffy and, crump and uh, you know, crumpled. It can be anywhere in between that and the nice smooth cup on the right. Um, I don't know if you all are seeing yourselves on there, but you shouldn't. Um, so within Helvella, we can find any intermediate that we want between uh, what I'm calling a lollipop and a stipitate cup. And uh, in this case, the evolution probably happened the opposite direction. Probably started with things more like this, or actually with cups without stems at all. And then over time, Helvella and its close relatives like Gyromitra and Morcella um, pushed themselves up on a stem and did weird stuff with the cups on top and got to really deformed things like this. So we've ended up with cups on stems. Most of the more attractive, larger um, cups on stems are ascomycetes like these three, but there are basidiomycetes that do it like this one. And we're going to get something weird again. So this is Winnea sporastoides. It's um, not just a weird species; it's also really rare, and it's it's weird for the genus it's in. It's in the genus Winnea, where normal species just produce clusters of nice, clean cups like this. Um, underground, they have a buried sclerotium, like a ball of tissue. But Winnea sporastoides has those cups on top crumpled into this sporozoid mass, and it has this weird stubby stem underneath. So it's intermediate between a cup on a stem or a cluster of cups on a stem and a sporozoid mushroom, hence the name Winnea sporozoides. So that takes us to the sporozoid mushrooms. Uh, of course, we have sporosis itself, the cauliflower mushroom. We have all kinds of other stuff. There's leafy jellies. There's Ionomedotus, which is like a cluster of crumpled cups. There's Ilaria flabelliformis, which looks like a wad of bubble gum. There's plenty of other things too. It's a really cool category. And we can mess with that one a bit. Um, all three of the pictures on top are the same species, Sporasis spathulata. It's just at different stages or different forms. And the more we let these lobes on top of it 
run into each other and fuse into each other, the more they'll end up forming distinct chambers that are pretty much the equivalent of giant thick pores. So the sporasis on the, on the right is kind of doing the same thing as this abortiporus down here, which is really just a, a chunky, awkwardly shaped cap that's completely covered with pores. This thing in the middle is Urpex latum marginatus, uh, formerly Emia and Oxyporus. And it's pretty much a pore crust, but it's kind of bubbling up into these lumps that are a bit their own distinct uh, parts of the fungus. They're, they're thinking about it. And then Pycnoporellus albaludius on the right is doing that a bit more. It kind of looks like a crust overall that's kind of smeared out all over the log, but it's bubbling up into these somewhat distinct um, protruding blob-like, cap-like segments. So the point is there are weird intermediates between sporasoid things and between pore crusts. So here are some pore crusts. There are a whole lot of pore crusts. Um, I chose two. There's a pretty normal one on the top, which is Fibroporia ridiculosa. It's yellow, it's pretty, but it's pretty normal. The one on the bottom is Porothelium fimbriatum, and it's weird for two reasons. So one reason it's weird is if you look closely, uh, you can see it's made from a bunch of really tiny cups squished together. So um, that's very unusual. Hardly any crusts are built that way. The other reason it's weird is because it was pretty recently evolved, um, all evidence suggests, from agarics, from mushrooms that look like this. And um, it's not only a pretty recent evolution, these have now been combined into the same genus, um, and they actually might even be in the same species group. So this is Porothelium fimbriatum, and this is something in the Porothelium omphaliiformi group. That's pore crusts. Here's some more pore crust-ish things. Um, so let's look at what it means to be a pore. Um, a pore is gonna be defined by some walls that surround it. And if those walls erode irregularly over time, or if they grow irregularly over time, then some segments of those walls are gonna stick out more than others. And the more that's the case, the more jagged those wall edges end up being, uh, the more you're gonna have little segments of the walls stick out. And those little segments are gonna be like flattened plate-like teeth. So that's what's happening with the trichaptum and the xylodon here. They're both, um, they're both crusts. They're both, um, I believe they're both on their way from pores to teeth, certainly the trichaptum is, but they're right on the middle. If you complete that process, whether it's imaginary or not, you're going to end up with a, a tooth crust that has no uh, remnants of pores left. Um, this is one of my favorite categories, but it's a pretty simple one. But the teeth on the tooth crust aren't always that big, they aren't always that obvious, so they can be any size. They can be little nubs or little granules, they can even be microscopic. So um, there's no particular dividing point where you would have to say, well, this isn't a tooth crust anymore. This is just a smoothish crust that's just roughened. If it's totally not got any granules or protrusions or anything like that left, then it really is a smooth crust. And most of these are going to be basidiomycetes on wood, at least most of the ones we notice, but there are exceptions to both of those. If you take your crust and you lift up the edges just a little tiny bit, then nobody's gonna care. You still just have a crust, it just has upturned edges. But if you start looking at smaller and smaller crusts that are spread out over a smaller and smaller area, and if you look at ones with larger and larger upturned edges, then eventually you're gonna be looking at a cup. And there's not a lot that really likes to be on that borderline, but the genera around Allurodiscus, which is this one, really like to be right in the middle there, even when they're mature. 
That takes us to cups. We're two thirds of the way through the mushrooms and I'm gonna get into the home stretch. Here's a slide full of cups. Most of them are well behaved. They're mostly attached at the middle um, to the substrate at the middle of the base. That's great for them. This weird one at the top left is auricularia. And um, it's one of the very few exceptions that I know of to that. It's a cup that's attached at the side to the substrate. It happens, it happens to be gelatinous. Um, it happens to be upside down, but it's a cup that's attached by the side. So if we take one of those nicely behaved cups and poke in the edges a little bit, uh, we're just gonna have a cup that has some lobes around it. And if we do that a lot, we're gonna get a really weirdly deeply lobed cup like these calathellas. Uh, it kind of reminds me of pig Sorry, what? I think someone just got themselves off the mute accidentally. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, um, so what we have by getting these really weirdly deeply lobed cups is this calathella. It's calathella digitiformis. And uh, you might notice that as we keep pulling in these lobes, we're making them uh, deeper and sharper, more consistent. Um, we're adding more of them, making them denser. Then the edges of one lobe are going to be kind of approaching the edges of the next lobe. So the right edge of one lobe is going to be pressed up against the left edge of the next lobe. And if you imagine doing that more and more, you would have these things that look like gills that are coming in pairs. And there's one mushroom that's famous for its gills coming in pairs. And of course, that's Schizophilum commune. And that really is what's going on in Schizophilum commune. So I traced around the edges of this one, and you can see. Um, the way the gills are formed, they're like the edges of a cup that's just got really, really deep, sharp lobes pulled into it. That's not just the way Schizophilum commune develops um, from a young fruiting body to an old one. That's also what happened in evolutionary history to it. So it's fairly closely related to the calathella um, in the background. It's related to a lot of cups. And it's even closer related to Schizophilum amplum, which is a cup in the same genus. It really belongs in the same genus. And it doesn't have uh, any lobes or gills or anything. It's just a cup, but it's a Schizophilum too. So on the left here, we've got a fully fledged Schizophilum commune with nice split gills. Totally doesn't look like a cup anymore. It's got gills. It's a gilled bracket. It doesn't have a stem. If you remember, we lost our stem back at uh, Winius parasoides. So we've got gilled brackets here. And just like cups, they can be attached at the middle, at the base, like the schizophilum on the left, or they can be attached at the side, like Crepidotus and like Tremedes are doing here. So if we look at what gills are, um, they're big, long, continuous parallel plates. We could define them as something like that. And if we mess with those criteria a bit, we make them a little bit less parallel, a little less long, a little less continuous, then we're going to get something like Herpicodon pendulous, the thing on the left, that's halfway in between gills and teeth. So the more you chop up these gills, the more you blend them up, um, you, you end up with something that looks like wide flattened teeth that are approaching gills or chopped up gills that are approaching wide flattened teeth. Same thing is going on over here with the Lentinellus, although this species, whatever it is, doesn't normally do that. But towards the base of the cap, these gills are getting chopped up into wide teeth. If we were to complete that process, making those, uh, those plates thinner and thinner, making their arrangement less and less parallel, we would end up with just a sea of thin protrusions, which would also be known as just regular teeth. And there are a couple genera that reliably make nice straightforward toothed brackets. So there's Gloiodon on the left, 
and donkia on the right. And there are also things that are attached at the middle to the substrate, like this hydnellum down here. And hydnellum starts out without a stem like that, but as it grows, it develops an indistinct stem on its way to having a distinct one. So it's one of the things that's intermediate between a toothed bracket and the toothed stipitate thing. So we have hydnellum doing that. We have pseudohydnum here. Um, this might be a mature one. It just has that weird protrusion that some people might call a stem and some people might not. And this thing on the right is, excuse me, this thing on the right is Ariscalpium bilipes. Um, it does have really, really tiny teeth covering the entire underside of the cap. I don't know how clearly the resolution is coming through, but it does. And it has this weird nub-like, fold-like, maybe stem-like thing attaching the cap to the substrate. If we totally grow a nice distinct stem, we have a stipitate hydnoid thing. So we might have Ariscalpium vulgare. It grows on conifer cones, it's really cool. Pseudohydnum usually has a more distinct stem like this. And hydnum itself, the hedgehog mushroom, totally has a stem. So all three of these are probably gonna be more familiar. And something really unfamiliar, this is a somatoderma or maybe a couple in section cladoderis. They grow in tropical areas and they're really weird because they're intermediate between having a stem and not. They've got these, again, these nubs, these protrusions, and they're intermediate between having teeth with these little pointy warts and having wrinkles with these wrinkly things that are kind of below the warts. They're also kind of continuous with the warts, kind of the same thing in a way going on here. It's worth staring at both of these for a while because it's a very weird fertile surface. But what they are for this purpose is intermediate between a stipitate hydnoid thing and a wrinkled bracket. So a thing with a wrinkled fertile surface and no stem at all which uh, Bisomeruleus corium is a great example for. It does more often produce just a crust um, with, with these caps being more like lips turned up on the edges of the crust, but it totally can make these nicely formed caps, nicely formed wrinkles on the underside that aren't gonna be confused with anything else. And Flebia tremulosa is supposed to be just another well-behaved wrinkled bracket. I think pretty much everyone would just call these wrinkles, but the wrinkles are pretty sharp and they're kind of setting apart pretty distinct little pockets or little holes um, that you could go in with the marker and just point out each one of these distinct little holes. And that sounds a lot like pores. I don't have a very convincing reason why these aren't pores, just that they're more or a lot more shallow than the pores that we're used to which are the ends of long tubes. So maybe just by the shallowness of these dimples in Flebia tremulosa between the wrinkles, we're gonna probably be more comfortable calling it merulioid or wrinkled than poured, but it's totally on its way to being a polypore. So um, the pores we're used to again, they're the ends of long tubes. They're super deep, super narrow. Usually they're attached at the side to the substrate. So all these big photos are just doing that. They're usually on wood. They can be attached by the middle of the cap, by the back of it, like this thing down here. If we take that polypore and we stretch it out and smear it out on whatever it's growing on um, at both the level of the pores and the whole fruiting body, then we're gonna be extending those pore walls into, into plates that look like gills. And we're gonna be smearing that bracket into something that looks like a crust. It's gonna be smeared along the wood. And that's what this species, Subantrodia juniperina, always seems to, to do. It's always right in between a poured bracket and a gilled crust. So these are the gilled crusts themselves. And I think this is a really fascinating category, um, maybe even more so than the Meruliad one, because there really are so few of these. 
Um, there are tons of gilled mushrooms with and without stems. There are tons of crusts with pores, with teeth, with whatever you want. But for some reason, there are almost no gilled crusts. Um, there's only one really great example of a species that reliably does it, which is Pseudomeruleus aureus, the pretty yellow thing at the top. This thing on the bottom is Trimedes betulina, and it is forming a great gill crust in the bottom half down here, but in the top half, it's making brackets. It's making caps that are sticking out of the wood. It's always gonna be classified as something with a cap, and that stuff down on the bottom, the crust part, we're just gonna think of as an extra uh, appendage to it. It's kind of superfluous. It's never gonna be classified under the crusts. So. If anyone finds any more gill crusts, let me know about those too. If the gills on your gill crust are veiny enough, they're shallow, blunt, wiggly enough, maybe running in different directions, maybe unevenly spaced, you're gonna be more inclined to call them wrinkles. Like these two, which are one or two species in the Auricularia mesenterica group, they do form more distinct caps as they grow older. So these little flaps on top are gonna to grow a lot bigger. But when it's young, it can look kind of like a gilled crust and kind of like a wrinkled crust. So here's a wrinkled crust, a really well-behaved one. This is my favorite crust to find. It's uncommon, but not really uncommon um, in the east half of the US at least. It's Serpula hemantioides. It's in the Bolateles and it's just a wrinkled crust. And that's it. So what we've done is we started with an earth star, found intermediates all on every step we needed to take all the way to a wrinkled crust. Um, that's gone through all of these forms, all 22 of these, and there was an intermediate between each of them. Um, these forms were defined by really simple features like does it have a cap, does it have a stem, does it have pores, does it have teeth? And I'm claiming that pretty much all of the mushrooms can fit in this classification. If you look at all of these as landings on a staircase and you find steps in between whatever pairs of them you want. Now, there actually definitely are a couple mushrooms that won't fit on this, but I don't, well, maybe with 15 minutes left, there is time to have a slide of that. But um, for now, I'm just gonna thank all the people whose photos I stole, um, along with my own. And thank you for watching it. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was awesome. So much eye candy and just really fun to think about that classification system. I know April's been keeping an eye on the chat. If folks have questions, you can put them in the chat and uh, let's, let's ask some of them of Jacob. Sure, but a morphological ringer and notice that they entirely lack the fruity aroma of cantharellus um, asked whether the aroma might be a more telling characteristic about their lineage and the morphology any any thoughts on that um, she thought it might be plausible since what we smell are their you know metabolic processes that we're picking up on yeah there might be um, i don't have much insight into it, but in that case, it definitely is more telling because they have the exact same basic form and they have a different smell. Um, there definitely are smells that are consistent with pretty large clades. Like one that comes to mind is farinaceous smells are um, like flowery um, or cucumber-like smells are really highly concentrated all over the suborder Trichlomatinii. Nagarcales, so trichlomatoid clytosoboid things. And so that's bigger than species, bigger than genus, bigger than family. So um, I don't know about the apricot smell of chanterelles being particularly widely distributed, but it definitely could be. Um, Annie wanted to know what. Um some of the consequences of these changes that you find most interesting? Which changes? Um, I, I guess I thought in terms of, oh, morphological changes. Okay, I was gonna interpret that differently actually. 
Well, I don't think, well, I certainly don't have any idea about how these changes actually happened, um, about whether it was really slow um, in evolutionary time or whether um, in one generation something changed. So I would be really fascinated to learn about those changes, but I have no insight at all about it. And I don't think very many people, if any, do. Um, question if this is going to be the new categorization for the, the new Audubon guide. Um, yes and no. Well, more no than yes. Um, I made up the forms for the Audubon guide um, a while before I landed on, on this classification on something I was this comfortable with. So I would say the ones in the guide are gonna be a little more clunky and awkward. And obviously there's not gonna be this many of them. It's not gonna be 22 different forms, but um, there's probably gonna be some, some things that are reminiscent in it. Um, I'm not calling things lollipops, but I am calling them miscellaneous capitate, I believe in there. Um, so that'll be interesting. There's a category I called hard, meaning hard to, um, hard to classify. And I put that in as a placeholder and then the, uh, the publishing people just went with it and I never remembered to change it. So I think that's actually going in the book as hard. And it just means the various blob-like things that usually grow on wood that don't fit in any normal category. Rue Vandegrift drew the icon uh, symbols for the forms in the book. And those are really beautiful and creative and perfect. So that might be the best part of the book that's coming out is his little drawings. And when is that coming out? I don't really know. The last I heard was spring next year, um, but I'm not sure how much we can trust that date. So it'll come out when it comes out. Uh, follow question, do these various forms reflect improvements in survival, do you know? Yes, they do. Um, I think there's good evidence that um, developing gills and pores, um, or at least developing a, developing a cap on a stem has helped mushroom uh, diversification, maybe uh, lack of extinction. I'm not too familiar with it, but I think there is evidence for that. Um, it's obviously not necessary though. It's not hugely important because there are um, crusts that evolved from, well, you saw with porothelium, that's in the middle of a giant clade of gilled mushrooms and it just turned into a crust and it's doing just fine. Um, well, that's a, a cup crust or a pork crust, but even um, there are examples of gilled mushrooms that turned into just simple, smooth, flat crusts, and those are doing just fine. So it obviously can't be a really essential improvement even to have gills and a cap and a stem over just being smeared out on a log. Because the the truffles are evolved from gilled above ground mushrooms. Yeah, some of them did. Yeah. Um, are a lot of form of are a lot of forms of convergent evolution in the sense that the forms don't track from the clade? I didn't hear the second part. They def there definitely are a lot of forms that are convergent evolution. So pretty much all of these have, I think we can say every single one of the forms that I showed has unrelated, um, has unrelated clades building it. Um, so I'm just kind of reading these out without uh chance to really process them. So the, the findings seem to be that the morphological similarity only loosely correlates with ancestral commonality, but clearly the same forms evolve over and over in the kingdom fungi. So maybe this points at molecular properties of, of chitin. I don't know anything at all about chemical properties of chitin.
with that, I think that taps other questions. A lot, a lot of food for thought. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for all those questions. That was fun. Thank you. Thank you again, Jacob. And thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, stay tuned. You will probably have a bunch of emails coming in about upcoming forays and um, all the Northeast Mycological uh, Consortium presentations that'll be happening this month. Um, so yeah, hope to hope to see people out in the field before too long and keep your eyes peeled from where else. And everything, all these other cool things. <laughs> I, I think this was this presentation was such a great reminder of like for me, mushroom hunting. I started foraging, but have become just so fascinated by the biodiversity and all the beautiful forms that are out there. So it's it's a good remember reminder to appreciate all the little crusts and things that we see even before all the good edibles pop up. And with that, I will let everybody go. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>